Good morning, church. How we doing? Yeah. Happy October. It's here. 2024 is three quarters of the way through. Doesn't feel real. But man, we've got a lot of exciting stuff happen here at church before the year is done. And so uh, we're just, we're thrilled about that. Man, hey, how good did Pastor Harley do this past Sunday with it pre giving that? Yeah, bringing the word. Incredible, incredible, incredible. Well, hey, let's go ahead and get into the scriptures today. We're going to be in Philippians chapter two. I got a real Bible. I got an analog Bible. I printed off the internet for y'all this morning. Here it is, Philippians chapter 2. That's a that's a, that's a young person joke, if y'all don't get it. Okay, here we go. Philippians chapter 2, verse 1. So if there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Verse four, let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. Have this in mind among, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death, on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray this morning. Father, our hearts and our minds are open to receive what you have for us today. Do the deep work let your word penetrate our hearts and do the deep work of forming us into the image of your son, Jesus. Be with us today, in Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. Well, a couple of things to kick off. Number one, if this is your first time here, welcome. I'm Pastor Luke. I'm the lead pastor here at St. Andrews. We're so grateful that you've chosen to, to join us this morning and worship with us. Now, also, with when it comes to, there's this kind of a caricature in the, in the American church that most people go, uh, I feel like every time I visit a church, they're always talking about giving. That kind of the, the gist there. They're like, the pastor is always hitting us up for money. Well, I hear you. I understand you. Um, what, I, what is important to me about this, about this message is that we grow in our understanding of what giving is. And here's why. It's important to the Bible. Not only is it important in the Bible, it was important to Jesus. So many teachings of Jesus involved giving. So if it's important to Jesus and it's important in Scripture, it's got to be important to us. And so I want you to understand, I want to go even further a little, uh, why this is such an important topic. Um, and, and so you understand how, why it is for us and why I want this to be, why I believe this needs to come to y'all, this, this series right here. October is normally uh, Pastor Appreciation Month across. That's, the, that's normally when it's done. Just so you know, we're not doing Pastor Appreciation this month because that is pretty slimy to do a series on giving and then also be like, hey, appreciate us. We're not doing that. We're not doing that because it's more important that what, what I believe God is leading and wants to teach and show our church, it's more important than us to receive and be appreciated. That doesn't mean that you guys aren't great at it. You guys are awesome at appreciating us. I'm so grateful for this uh, congregation. You're, you're amazing. Understand, this is, this is an important topic. Now, why is it important? Well, we just discussed it. It's important in Scripture. But here's another thing. A lot of times it's important because we're reiterating something maybe we already know. But I actually think this message in this series is going to help us transform and deepen and our understanding of what giving is. Because see, the problem, I think, within the modern, like American evangelical churches is when we talk about giving, one word comes to mind, tithes, tithe. Now, if you were raised in church and you're, uh, you're, you've been going to church for a long time, you probably know what a tithe is. It's the, it's, it's the giving of the first 10%, right? In scripture, in the Old Testament, they gave a tithe of the first 10% of, the, of their first fruits. 
And then now our modern iteration of that is we get paid and the 10% goes to the Lord. Now, that is not all there is to giving. And if that is all there is to giving, we are doing a really poor job of imitating Jesus. Tithing is not the end of what giving is. So today, we're going to break down what is giving. What is giving? So you're probably wondering, like, okay, first of all, we got a control center up here, and I get it, it, look, it looks crazy. I'm going to do something different today. I'm going to draw a little bit. Are y'all okay with that? Okay, I'm not an artist, so y'all are going to have to really, really bear with me, okay? So, so y'all just bear with me. All right, here we go. I want us to see this. This circle right here, well, I don't want that. I don't want red, mainly because I'm an Auburn fan. Um, and Alabama lost yesterday to the glory of God. Anyway, this circle right here, this circle right here, I'm sorry. I shouldn't make it. I should make football references out from the pulpit, but I have the mic and sometimes power is intoxicating. So uh, this circle right here, this is you and me. This circle right here is you and me. Now, when we talk about giving, I want us to think about this as a directional thing. When we give, there's this little arrow, we're giving out. Giving is, in its definition, it's literally the transfer of something to someone. Something that is, whether it's material or immaterial, to give is the action of transferring something that I have to someone else. But here's the deal. All, this right here, that little arrow, that's giving. That's just an action. That's all it is. It's just an action. Actions come from a motivation. Actions don't just happen, right? Like you and I, for instance, here's what we don't call giving. Taxes. That's not called giving. That's called taking, yeah, right? That's not, that comes from, we get, why do I give, why not pay my taxes? I don't want to go to jail. That's a good motivation, right? Giving is done by some sort of motivation. Let me give you, let me, let me tell you something. I, you know, uh, before you could, by the way, you guys can leave this picture up. Before I was in ministry, uh, when Makira and I, uh, first got married, uh, about a year, we celebrated about a, our, our first year anniversary, not about a first year, a first year anniversary. And now around that time, we found out we were pregnant with our, with our oldest. And so when you find out you're about to have your first kid, it's really good to have a job with benefits like healthcare. And at the time we didn't. And so I, uh, I shifted and I started working for a financial institution, uh, that had benefits. And also kind of aligned with my, with my, uh, some goals I had before even going into ministry. And so one of the things I learned within that is, um, nothing is free in the banking world, right? So like when you go to buy a car and you get a loan from the, from the bank or the credit union, they give you the money and then they go, would you just pay us back over time? Right? Well, no, yeah, you pay back over time, but you also pay what? Interest. You also pay interest. It's what they receive back from you. So that's not selfless giving, is it? No, that's giving, wanting something in return. Let's go back. Let's go back to the drawing board here. I'm going to erase this. I don't have an eraser, but I do have a back button. All right, here, this right here. This circle is us. Actually, no. Actually, I want you to think of this circle as the bank, and this is us. So they give you the money for a car, and then you give it back this way. Now, what we're going to look at here in a minute is this form of giving, where there is some sort of return on investment, an ROI, if you will. This is not selfless giving, and it's not scriptural giving. Because we're going to see that Giving does, has, if it's going to be in the way of Jesus, it has to be 
selfless. They can't be selfish. Now, by the way, for those of you who work in financial institutions or work or own businesses, it's okay to make money. It's so that's not that that's not what we're talking about here. But your business is not a 501c3 nonprofit doing charitable donations, right? No. You perform an action to receive payment. But in the life of faith in Jesus, giving is an action that has to come from generosity, selfless generosity. So now what we're going to do, we're going to go back to our scripture. We're going to go back to our scripture. Before we do, let me give you a little bit of a background on, on, on Philippians. Philippians is one of those, hold on a second, let me struggle with this water bottle. There we go. I get real. These water bottles, are, there's got to be a better way of doing this. I don't know. I'm going to get one of those camel backpacks to wear up here and just slurp while, while I'm talking. In Philippians, there's one of the few times the Apostle Paul is writing to a church and he's not giving them the business. Because, you know, a lot of times, Apostle Paul, when he writes to a church in any of those epistles, he's writing and it's like some tough stuff, right? He goes, he's, it's basically like, hey, I, the Apostle Paul, am writing to you to get it together or you're going to burn. I don't know what he, I don't even know how to make this any nicer. You guys are messing up. When it comes to Philippians, though, Philippians is one of those books where it's, a, it's the church in Philippi and Paul is writing. It's kind of, he's kind of a joint letter. So it's like Paul and Timothy, right? One of his partners within the ministry. He's writing to them and he's like, oh, you can sense the, the love that he has for the Philippians. Like he loves this church. He loves this church. Now here's the deal. What Paul hints at is that in, in chapter one, he's telling you there's something happening where Paul is talking about their suffering and their oppression. Now, there's been some different thoughts on what exactly that is, but, the, but for, the, for the gist of what we need to know today, this church is going through a tough season. Have you ever been part of a tough season? Yep, you ever been in a church that went through a tough season? Okay, you know. Well, this is like Paul writing to you in that season, trying to encourage you. He's trying to encourage you, and he's telling them, okay, if there's one thing I can tell you to do, and that how, that's how chapter two starts. So now what I'm going to do, we're going to look here, these first, few, these first few verses here of Philippians 2, verses 1 through 4. So he goes, so if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the spirit, any affection and sympathy complete by joy, by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full, of cord, full accord and of one mind. Now, what he's saying here is, if there is anything that you have ever taken away from my teachings, if there's anything I can tell you to help you through this season and this time, be unified. Be unified. It looks like he's repeating himself when he says same mind and one mind. He thought what it's really meaning, and when he says same mind, being the same mind, it, think together. Think based on the same way, in the same wavelength, which later on we're going to talk, he talks about the, having the mind of Christ. Think like Jesus. And then when he goes on, say, being a full accord of one mind, he's saying, now, be, you, you're thinking like Jesus, now be together and always think like you are one person. Think the same, think like Jesus, and then think like you are, you are one body. Be, another way of saying, be unified. Be unified. Now you're going, Pastor, what does this have to do with giving? You hang tight. We're going to get there. Then he goes on in verse 3. He says, what is the, he gives us the problems to unity. He says, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. So be unified. Well, what is going to cause disunity? Selfish ambition and conceit. But then he goes, but in humility, that's the word we're going to, we're going to hold on to there for a second. 
But in humility, what's the opposite of selfish ambition and conceit? Count others more significant than yourself. I need you, you're going through a tough season. You need to be unified. Here's how it looks like when you're not unified, when you are selfish and conceited. And how do you battle against that? You got to humble yourselves and you've got to put other people above yourself. He's saying you need to change your mind and how you see yourself within the church and within relation to other people. You have to count yourself not more important than others. And then he goes, here's, let me say this again. Let each of you, here's the problem. Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but the interest of others. The interest of others. Now, this is so interesting to me because I think it's hard for us as, as, the, as the church to really grasp the imperative, the forceful, the importance of what Paul is saying to this church. Because Paul is writing to them as if this message is so important that if you don't listen to what I'm saying to you, brothers, I love you. You are incredible, Christ-like followers of Jesus Christ, the risen Savior. But if you don't stand together, you're going to crumble and the church is going to fall apart. And so I'm trying to help you. Here's the, here's the red flags. When you're selfish and conceited. Conceit, what is that? Va being vain. Or a real hot button word right now. Being a narcissist. Being narcissistic. Counting yourself more important. And he said, now change your mind. If you humble your, yourself, you'll change your mind and you'll see others as more important than yourself. And he goes, Another thing, don't look out just for your own interest, but you've got to also look out for the interest of others. So if the first one was a mind change, now we're talking about a heart change. Because if I'm always counting others as more important than myself, then my heart is always going to be going, well, I've got to put other people's interests out there too. I can't just look out for myself. Now, here's where it gets wild. Philippians 2, 5 through 8. He says this in verse five. He says, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. So I'm reading, this is the ESV version. I think the NRSV actually says this verse better. It says this, let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. So he's saying, okay, I gave you the warning or gave you the, what you need to do, what you don't need to do, what you need to change. Now, think like Jesus. So how would Jesus think? How would Jesus think? He says, now this is, this is where things start getting wild and your theology, but it's, about, it's not already getting uh, deepened. It's going to get deepened today. Verse six, it says who Jesus, right? Though he was in the, what? The form of God. He did not what? He did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. Pause for a second. So I want to make sure we're getting this. We have Jesus Christ. Now remember what we believe about Jesus. He's the, he's the son of God. He is fully divine and he was fully human. We're going to talk about that here in a second. But remember before Jesus was born, he was in his full glorified divine estate. Right here in the Bible, it says he was in the form of God, right? We believe that the, our theology is we believe in the Trinity, right? Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And each of them are, we believe in one God in three persons. So right here, Paul says, let me show you what full generosity and what looking out for the interest of others looks like. It looks like Jesus, who was fully divine, yet he did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. Understand what grasp, this word right here in the Greek. So look, don't let, don't let your eyes glaze over. I see some of you. Y'all hang tight. It's this word called harpag, harpagmos, harpagmos. And it means this. It has two meanings. It can mean to grasp something forcefully 
which, do, which one does not have. Think of like plundering, exploiting, you know, road like the other pirates, right? They took things by force that weren't theirs. And then it also could mean to retain by force what one possesses. It means like, oh, no, no, hold on to what you have. So what Paul is saying here is Jesus, the Son of God, was in the form of the Father. And he did not count that form, what he had, as something to be held on tightly to. It means he also, when he took on the human form, did not fight to take it back. He willfully, what? Gave it. He gave it up. Why did he do it? Verse 7. Here it is. And here's the, here's the, the, big, the big moment here. It says Jesus, he emptied himself by taking on the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. Jesus, then to this, this, this theological term called kenosis, meaning to empty. And there's been a lot of topic about what is that? What did he empty himself? Well, what, at least what we can grasp here from what Paul is saying is he had the form of God, yet he did not hold on to it. He willfully gave that up, taking on the likeness of men, right? We believe that Jesus Christ was fully divine and fully human. So he became fully human. As a servant, the full glorified status he had, he gave up. Why, though? Verse 8, being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, death on the cross. So, Paul's writing to the church and says, you're being attacked, you're suffering. The way to get past that and to endure that is to be unified. Let me tell you what unity looks like. It looks like caring for each other. It looks like putting others before yourself. And if you want to understand how that works, look to, your, look to our risen Savior. Because see, what Jesus did was he was fully, he lived in a fully glorified state. And he, oh, out of obedience to the Father, he gave that up so that he could take on what? Human form, so that he could go to the cross and fulfill all the requirements for humanity's justification to saving us from our sin and bringing us back into relationship with the Father and giving us the access to eternal life. All because... He gave out of a generous heart. He gave what only the Father could give him. That is giving. That is what Jesus Christ shows us. So what do we take from this? What do we, what do we learn from this? The first thing is we learn that giving honors God. Giving honors God. If I'm following in the path of Jesus, Jesus gave up what he gave up to honor the Father out of a worshipful, out of a worshipful action. A worshipful. Think about this. Remember, what does John 3.16 say? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, right? We'll put it in context with Philippians 2 here. It's really for God so loved the world that he gave his son, who also loved God so much that he was willfully given. It's not just that he gave him to us. Jesus, the son of God, said, send me, God. What do you need done? Am I the only way to do it? Then send me. I'll take it on. I don't need, I don't have to hold on to this state. It's more important that I honor you with my, with whatever you need. And if that means I need to give something up, then I'm going to give it up. That's what Jesus shows us. So before we start talking about the practice of giving, we actually have to know what is giving. 
And Jesus says, when you're in me, if you're a Christian, you're a follower, you're a disciple of Jesus, and this life of faith, giving start as a way to honor God, because Jesus shows us that whatever we have, we really don't have. Whatever we have, it was given to us. And that anything that we hold on to, that we're unwilling to give up, it's we say, God, this is more important to me than you are to me. You, this right here is more important to me. When we may say, why, why should I give this up? I worked hard for this. What the scripture show, shows us is, no, you didn't work hard for that. Gave you the life that you have. Who gave you the brain that you have? The body that you have? Who gave you the family that probably paid for your college? Who opened the doors for you to get the job that you have right now? Who's the one that showed you? You go, I will even look at the life of faith. People go, I'm a, I'm a great Christian. I'm like, probably first in line, going into heaven and into eternity. I got, I got a Disney Fast Pass for eternity. Boy, oh boy. Who, who gave you your faith? Who showed this to you? To think that you have anything is to completely misunderstand who you are in relationship to God. You have nothing. Everything you have is a gift from the Father. And if God calls you to give something up, you better give it up. You better give it up. Now, here's the deal. In the Old Testament, tithe, tithing was important. I told you we're going to circle back and talk about this, right? And we're going to actually expand on this uh, in, 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 the, in the coming weeks. But tithing was just 10%. And it was under the law, I give my 10%. And that does my th and I'm good. But under the new covenant, what Jesus Christ established there is no ceiling on giving. Because remember, the law was meant to justify people before God. But what did it show us? No, the law can't justify us before God because we're sinful people. The law just showed us how sinful we are. And so Paul goes back and over in Romans 3, he, he tells them, he goes, there's no way to justify yourself through obedience to the law, only Jesus Christ can justify you before the Father. And so whatever you try to do, when we try to, you go, well, I've given my 10%. Well, that does nothing except just that. If it's not done out of generosity and out of worship, if you think you're giving, it's going to justify you before the Lord, or you're giving that 10% because you're looking for something in return out of it, then you've missed the heart of giving. Because the deal is, we're calling this series the art of giving, because what is art? It's a creative output that is unique to the artist. Here's what I believe and what scriptures show us, is that generosity expands under Jesus Christ. And that this giving, while we call it the art, it's an art because it's different for every single one of us. It's different for every single one of us. And that generosity flow should be flowing out, out of us. And we should all look for every opportunity for giving, for being generous. Because we go, God, there are my lungs, this body, my house, my car, my money. This moment, time, time. We say this, I want you to be generous with your time, your talents, and your resources. Because with, look, what, what did the widow do when she came before God? What did she give? She gave two mites. And the Pharisees go, what is this? This is nothing. And he goes, but she gave all that she had. It's not about comparing yourself to other people. It's not about justifying yourself before God. Well, God, I mean, I know I've sinned a lot over here, but I really did give a lot at church. Well, that's not the point. The point is to develop a heart of generosity, to give selflessly, to the Father, like Jesus. It's not a lot of amens. Yeah, I get it. Yeah, I get it. I get it. It's a tough one. The second thing is, is that giving, giving transforms us. Giving transforms us. 
We don't give to get. But when you give, it does something to you. It does something here. What's the heart? We just talked about it a minute ago. Verse 6, though he was in the form of God, he did not count equality God with God a thing to be grasped. I don't have to hold on to this. I don't have to keep this. This doesn't give me satisfaction and wholeness. Only obedience to your will gives me satisfaction and wholeness. There's a lot of very rich people that die very, very broken and empty. It also challenges our idea of what generosity and giving actually is because there's a lot of very generous people who are generous because of what it's going to do to their self-image, what it does to make them feel. It, it, that's, not, that's not why we do it. We give selflessly so that God, so that our hearts will change. And by the way, here's the deal. Let me, let me give you some practical advice. It's a practical advice that, it, that transforms into the spiritual. For those of you, now I, what's been really cool is I've had a lot of people that have come and talked to me about um, they just started giving to the church, which is incredible. It's hard. When you've never done that before, I'm telling you, it's hard. A sacrifice is hard, and the Lord sees it. The Lord sees the sacrifice. Guess what? Sacrifice, sometimes you have to talk yourself into sacrificing. Sometimes you have to remind yourself why you're doing something. Because sometimes sacrifice is painful. It's pain painful. It doesn't always feel good. And the, the people that would make you feel bad for struggling with, do, do I do this? Do I not do this? Remember, even Jesus Christ, when he took on the form of flesh, before he was fully went to the cross, he begged God, Lord, God, take this cup from me. I don't want to do this. But he, the point is that he did it anyway out of obedience. Not that it was perfectly easy. If you're going to come away from this series or this sermon today thinking that I have ever meant that giving is easy and should just be easy, we should always want to do it. Don't mishear me. I don't want to give all the time. That's right. I don't always feel generous. But, I, but when I push past it, I go, oh, I see it now, God. I see what you're doing. Okay. Okay. And normally when I'm generous here, I'm a lot more generous out there. Because see, here's the next point. Here's the next thing that we was trying that 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 um that Paul was trying to say. He was saying, giving unite the church, it brings us together. And see what happens is he goes, look, as you as you give together, you live together, you grow together for the glory of God and for the protection, the protection that comes from a united church. And then what happens is when you give and the world sees a united church, one that is fueled by selfless generosity, it starts to change the world because the gospel and the real message of Jesus Christ starts to get out there and they go, oh, that's what transformation looks like in the life of Christ. That's what salvation looks like. I don't have to, I'm not controlled by the whims of this world. I'm controlled and out of submission and obedience, not, not controlled against my will. I'm, I submit myself to be, be controlled by the Father, by his spirit, to be to, out of love, to show and to share that love because we need these hearts to be changed into something that is generous and giving. Because this world needs a church that wants to generously give, not because they want something out of it, just because they want to love. They see the need, they meet the need, and they ask nothing in return. That's what Jesus shows us. That's the heart of Jesus. It's been the heart of Jesus before time. Right? We believe that he's the eternal son of God the eternal son of God. It's the craziest thing because part of it, there's this there's kind of a diagram that P, that they look at. Go back to this for a second. Uh, almost. Oh, 
There it is. So if this is Jesus in his fully glorified state, then out of obedience, he came down here. But see, you remember what it says going on in verse 9. It says, therefore, God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. So Jesus obeyed to the point of death on the cross, and the Lord, the God, the Father, wrote, he, wrote, he raised him back to life. And then after that, what did he do? He brought him back into glory. But Jesus didn't try to take that back. He didn't try to take that away. He didn't try to hold on to it. But then look what God the Father does. He says, the path. He says, Jesus, you're now going to be the path. My son, you're now the path to me. You're the path that people will go through. Because when they when they say that they declare your name to be Lord, they are honoring me. But they've got to they got to honor your name. Remember what Jesus said. I reveal who the Father is. No one, no one comes to the Father except through me. And if you want to understand the Father, you have to look to me. So not only is the Son of God a generous and benevolent Son of God, the Father, God, our Creator, is a generous and benevolent God. And to think otherwise is to think incorrectly about the nature of the divine. Because God's love and God's character and nature is fully generous. Think about your own salvation. He goes, they can't do it on their own. I'm going to do it for them. And then when he goes, you can't, you can't earn your salvation. He goes, your faith, your faith, you will receive grace through faith, and be saved from your sins. Reunited with the Father. Brought on path, the path of healing and restoration. How many know God is a good God as has loved you so deep and you have received that love? Yeah. The giving church wants that right there for those people out there and the rest of this world. That's why we give to honor God, to unite together against the forces of a culture that is selfish. Our culture is selfish. And giving is an act of violence against that idea. It says, no, we're falling in the ways of Jesus. Come stand up across this place this morning. You know, in a sermon, uh, a sermon like this, this is a, uh, like the, similar to what Paul was doing the Philippians. I want this both as a head change and a heart change, because I want this to be transformative, to be expressed in the life of this body of, of, of believers. We need to be a generous church and we need to understand this full idea of generosity, the, how expansive it is under Jesus Christ. And when we want to be like Jesus, we got to be generous people. We got to be giving people. And so today I really just want us, we're going to pray and worship and have our, and have our, uh, our prayer team down here like normal. So I'm actually going to go ahead and invite the prayer team down, but I'm really going to invite you. So if you're, this is your first time here, if you're, a, if you're uh, either completely, you've never been, you've never received salvation through Jesus Christ, we're going to pray the prayer of salvation. If you're someone that has been far from God, and you want to be reunited, if you've got some sins to repent from, and we're going to pray that, we're going to pray that prayer. And also, if you just need, it's also okay to, to need to receive prayer. There's something about when the saints gather around each other and, and, and pray for each other. It's what we're called to do. Amen. So what we're going to do, we're going to bow our heads. We're going to close our eyes. We're just going to pray. And then I'm going to invite you down to the altar if you need prayer. And we're going to worship for a second, okay? Father God, right now I lift up this entire congregation and every person that is under the sound of my voice. Lord, I pray that those who need to receive salvation, 
that today, Lord, that they would receive your love and declare your son Jesus Christ as Lord of their life and, to, and, and repent of the sins that they may receive of forgiveness and be welcomed into this life of faith, this life with your son, Jesus Christ. And Lord, I pray for those who, who are in needing, who need repentance, who have been walking far away from you, who have been challenged by their own, by their own heart and their sinful natures. Lord, I pray that they would today, they would add it because they know that your grace is always benevolent and giving that they would repent and receive their forgiveness today. Be re being reunited, let something new start. And Lord, those who are just in need of a touch from you, let them, let them come down, bringing their cares and worries and hurts and pains to the altar to give them to you, to be surrounded by brothers and sisters that will lift them up in prayer, encouragement, and the power of your, of your Holy Spirit. Lord, be with us as we worship together. Be with us this week. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. I'm going to invite you to come on down now. If you need prayer, if not, let's worship together as one. Amen.